Father, they like this. We thank you, ancients of days, for this privilege you've given us to be in your presence. Father, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. Father, we surrender our all and say, may you come and take control. Father, we begin to cast out every plan of the enemy against this service or against this message. Father, we begin to put under the subjection of the Holy Ghost every thought or imagination that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that let your spirit take preeminent over this place. Father, come and speak to us and I surrender my all as a vessel of honor and say, Father, may I decrease that Jesus be glorified. Amen. I surrender my all and say, Father, speak through my voice. Lord, let this message not be filled with enticing words of my wisdom, but Father, let it be filled with power and of the Holy Ghost. Father, I pray that let the understanding of the, us as a church be enlightened, that we shall receive your word tonight, and Father, may we reevaluate ourselves and understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, come and take the glory. Amen. Holy Ghost, come and fill this place. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So, we will be looking at a, a short series that, will be, that has been divided into two messages by the grace of God. Next week, we will, we will uh, get part two of it. So, tonight, it's more of basics to set the foundation. So, I advise us to try to understand, to prepare us for a battle next week. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So this series I titled Gates. You know, gates, those are very common words that we all know. We know gates. Amen. Amen. So, but uh, the first one, the, or the, the word we'll be looking today is lift up your head. I entitled it, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Tell your neighbor, lift up your head. Lift up your head. I can't hear you. O ye, o ye gates. Hallelujah. So gates have heads. Amen. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. We'll look at Psalms 24. Hallelujah. Amen. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Amen. Amen. Now our key verse will be 7 to 10, but I would like us to take it from 1 to 10 so that we get the full picture of it. Amen. I read in the name of the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and its fullness. The well and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who has ascended into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and pure heart. He who has not lift up, lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he who shall receive, he shall receive, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. And from verse 7 to 10, it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. And he says it again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If we look at these Psalms critically, it has about, we can say it has, the pre, it talks about, if we look at it, it has a historical Part. I would like, before we go into the psalm, I would like to take us so we get an understanding for where we are going We are going to. Because I said, the purpose of this message is to lay the foundation for next week. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, this psalm is believed to be written by King David. And if we look at this psalm historic, historically, 
we can see that it, it is believed to be written either after David won the battle against the Philistines to take back the covenant box back to Jerusalem or when, it, when he won the battle or when he took back the covenant box into Jerusalem. So that's what, that is when it is believed to be written. Hallelujah. Amen. And this, these Psalms, we can relate to it literally, physically, and spiritually. And it has a lot of prophetic aspect. If we look at these 10 verses critically, there are a lot of things inside that we can see and we can learn, that we can understand how much God was using his servant King David. Amen. Now, when I spoke about the, the battle against the Philistines, we can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and 6. But I would like us just to read 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 to 25. Now the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel. And all the Philistines went up to search for David and, Dave, and David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Yes, yeah, stronghold. The Philistine also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Let me stop here and I will take it all over. We will continue, sorry. Now, what was happening in, the, in, in, in Israel at this time? This was after Saul was there. Amen. And now the Bible says, the elders of Israel remembered David who killed Goliath almost 38 years ago. Or, yes, it was more than 30 years ago because it, he, he was, uh, Saul, after Saul was sacked, David killed Goliath and we saw that he was running and Saul was all over looking for David. Now they remembered him. That was someone who has been anointed to be king over Israel. The time came, the people remembered him and they went in search of him. And now they anoint him to be king or they choose him to be king of Israel. They confirm what the Lord had done several years back. And the Bible says this is the same Philistines that David had defeated. When they heard that he has become king, when prophecy is being fulfilled in your life, the enemy rise up to try to kill you, not to fulfill God's plan for your life. This was exactly what happened. David was there, he was roaming the Philistines to not bother to revenge. When they made him king, they arose. And David, when David learned of it, he hid himself in the strongholds. It means there are strongholds. Because all the time we pray that we know the strongholds of the enemy. I'll try, because today I'm trying to limit this message to God and next week we take the enemy. Amen. So we understand. So I'll try not to talk about strongholds of the enemy. But he hid himself in a stronghold. It means God was there. And now they came to war against David. David did not just go to war. He knew the oil on his head. Because remember when Saul died, he said he died as if there was no oil on his head. But the Bible says he inquired of God. Listen to what he asked. He did not ask God to protect him. He asked him if he would deliver. Listen, let's listen. Will you deliver them into my hands? He was not asking God if the, it's a battle that he should run away or should. De he knows he is, he's fighting. He has to win. So we, he was just asking if it was the will of God for him to go to the battle now. And the Lord said yes. He went. He, he won the battle. And we, let's continue. He said, and the Lord said to David, go up and I will doubtlessly, I will doubtless deliver the Philistine into your hands. So David went to Be, uh, Bel per, Perazim and David defeated them. Defeated them there and he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, I call the name of this place Belperazin. And they left and they left their images there. And David and his men carried them away. He was talking, other version talks about their, their idols, their God. 
that they carried David and his men. They went after they, they defeated the Philistines. They took the idols and the gods away. Amen. And the Philistines went up once again, deployed themselves in the valley of Rephan. There, therefore, David inquired of the Lord, and he said, "You shall." And he inquired of the Lord, and he said, "You shall, you shall not go up. Circle around them and come upon them." And come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of, of a march of marchings in the tops of the mulberry tree, then you will advance quickly. For then the Lord will go before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. He drove back the Philistine from Geba as far as Giza. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, as I said, when he defeated the Philistine, as the Bible makes us to understand that the, the, the devil, when a demon is cast, we, or, the, or, or when we overcome temptation, we are, the, the, the devil only leaves us for a season. It goes and it comes back. Or when a demon is casted out, it does not go. It has to come back to see if it can reattack, and it comes back stronger. This, this, this is practically we are seeing how it operates. It's physical example before we start talking about spiritual examples. Amen. They came back stronger, and this time he asked the Lord again. Now God gave him a specific instruction. This time, don't go, don't face them, cut them around, and the Lord Himself says. You will hear a sound on the top of the trees. What sound? It was the heaven army. That God himself came down to fight for David. If we serve God in the right way, he will descend and fight for you. He will descend and fight for me. God came down. David heard the sounds. Hallelujah. So this is what I want us to understand. There is a way that if we serve God, brothers and sisters, the right way, we have nothing to lose. He will fight for us. The problem is that we try to fight by our strength. But God can do it by himself. Now, if we go back to Psalms, now we are, looking, we are on Psalms 24, we'll come to Psalms 24. If we look at Psalms 23, I said this Psalms was written. written. Psalms 23 said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He forestores my soul. He lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear not evil, for the Lord is with me. His shepherd rod and staff protect me. He prepared a banquet for me in the presence of my enemy. Why was David making this bold statement? Because he has experienced God in first Samuel, uh, Second Samuel chapter 5 that we just read. That God himself descended. Now, now, he, now what was the covenant box? Why, 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 is this, why am I interested in the covenant box and the dwelling presence of God? The Bible says the covenant God, uh, box was where God's presence was manifesting. That the Israelites carried. And when they lost this covenant box in the battle against the Philistine, David got no peace. That was why immediately he was anointed as, as king. He was, that was why he had to go back and get the covenant box. If we read, we will know about the power. If we read chapter 5 and 6, we will see the manifestation of God's presence that with the covenant box, where the act of the covenant was kept. And now there, that was why David was boasting, because he knows now that the box is coming with him to Jerusalem. He means the presence of God is with him. His shepherd rod will protect him. That was why he had no fear anymore. So if we have God in us, that is the mindset we are supposed to have. Not to be afraid. We know that God can fight for you. You know that God can fight for us as a church, as a nation. That is the mindset we need to have. So going back to our, 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 our text of uh, uh, Psalms 24, what are gates? We know gates are a point of entry of a space that is enclosed by a fence or wall. That's the point of entry. You know, 
and what are, uh, 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 we know gates are doors itself. But often when we are in English or when we are talking about gates, we don't, ref we don't refer to door. We do, we, 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 let's say big doors. So it's different from doors. We use doors when we are talking about houses. Hallelujah. So when the Bible says, when the psalmist is saying that lift up your head, O ye gates. If we use the historical perspective of this psalm, we realize that he was telling the gates to open because the covenant box is coming. The doors be open that God can dwell in Jerusalem again. Jesus, and Jesus said, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would Jesus say a thing like that? Why did he not say, let the will of God be done in heaven as it is on earth? Have we wondered about that? The heavens is the spiritual realm. So it means that things that are happening on earth, that are present on earth, are things that have already existed in the spiritual realm. So heaven was a spiritual. In the beginning, he created the heavens and, the, and not the earth and the heavens. So the heaven was finished. The spiritual reign was finished before the physical reign. That is why our battles, they are not physical, they are spiritual. That's what the scripture says. So we have to, sometimes the battles that we are struggling with it physically, we have been defeated in the spiritual reign. So we are just wasting time. But if we keep our guard, we, as the Bible says in Peter, be sober and vigilant. For the enemy is moving like a rolling lion. So if we keep our guard and we begin to pray for things that are yet to come, it means we start fighting them spiritually. Maybe what we, the life we are living today are things that have happened maybe three, four years back. I'm giving an example. I'm not saying that is the case. That's yes. So maybe the life we are living today, we are just, it's a, like a tape that has played in the spiritual. So if we begin to pray now, we are fighting battles. If you, like, for example, when we pray for our children, we break yokes. By the time they grow, they are 20, they are 30. The foundations are okay. So they have nothing to worry about. Not that they don't have nothing. They have their own things to worry, but we have set the foundation right. Sometimes there are things we struggle because our parents did not, did not, do, did not, did not pray and break those foundations. And if we, do, if, we do, if we do the same, we don't break them, our children will suffer the same effects. So now that we have come to knowledge and understanding, we have to take the mantle and begin to fight even for our children. So that was why Jesus was saying, let the will of the Father be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which, which gives me, brings me to the understanding that the Bible says when the Lord made everything, he said it was good. And when the, the Lucifer, the Lucifer perceived or seen or had iniquity in him, he was casted out. He bring me to the understanding that heaven is still is that let the perfectness that is in the spiritual realm in heaven also manifest in the physical. That is why it's very important when we see the physical things, we need to relate them to get that understanding of the spiritual things. That's why the Bible makes us understand that Jesus, the scripture makes us understand that have we not seen the things of this world? Have we not learned from them? Because their, their uh, representation, their existence gives us understanding of the spiritual reign. So if we are able to understand this, children, we'll get to we're going to have a clearer understanding of what I meant. There is a lot of information in these Psalms. There is prophetic, there, is the, there was a present, and there are also physical analogy that David was using to represent the spiritual reign. Hallelujah. So let's begin again from verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and its fullness, and all its fullness, the well and, and those who dwell therein. Hallelujah. So when the, when the Bible says the, the, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, what does that mean? It simply means it's the Lord that created the heaven, the earth. Let's, let's limit it to the earth, the world that we live. 
everything that is in the world belongs to God. That's why the Bible says, the Lord says, the silver is mine and the gold is his. There is nothing that we can give God from this world that is, that is, it is not his own. So we see that we label ourselves on things that are irrelevant. And sometimes we even pray and tell God that I have given, I have given my tithe. Open the flow gate of heaven as you said. Because that was what the Lord says. That if you give a ten and ask of me anything, I will give. But that is not the thing. That we, 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 we get it out of concept. God was not asking us to give us cars. To give us houses. Because if God give, you, give, us, give me an apartment, maybe tomorrow I want a, an etage or a skyscraper. But the things that God wants you and I to ask are spiritual things. Give God your tithe and say, open my eyes, let me see. Open my heart that I may do good. Open, help me to overcome this, unique, this weakness of mine that I may walk in righteousness. Those are the things God wants you and I to ask from him. Not material things. Because he knows we are just passing. We are just passing. This is not our home. That is why I'll go, when, we go, when we talk about it, he says everlasting doors. When we go to everlasting doors, we understand why he says everlasting doors to be open. So whatever it is that we want, the fullness of the well is of the Lord. No matter the problem that you have, if you want car, you want whatever you want, is of the Lord. Ask of him, he will give it to you. But there is only one thing. If we go further, he says, the well is mine. But if you go, you have to allow him to come in, his, in your life so that he'll be able to give you the fullness. We do not experience the fullness of God because we do not give him our all. We reserve part for ourselves. And look at verse 3. He says, who, shall, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Listen, brothers and sisters. Who may ascend into the hills? And who may enter into his holy place? It means there are hills and places where God dwells. You know, the devil always deceives us. There's a saying, we always say, that I do not need to go to church to praise God, for example. God is everywhere. Yes. The devil, that's why the Bible calls him the, 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 the old, the wise serpent. Because, you know, there is a, this, uh, there's a maturity, and there's a, I don't know how to use, use the word, where a comedian once defined uh, 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 maturity as an ability to stay as close, or, or was it lies? As an ability to stay as close to the truth as possible. So that when you are caught, you switch. You understand? So that is how the devil operates. He knows the scripture. He will tell us such lies that you do not need to go into the to church. You can pray everywhere. Because he, he is taking you gradually out of his presence so that he can deal with you. So that once you lower your guard, your shield, which is a shield of faith, he strikes. So those, those are just the tricks. That's what I want. It means David is saying there are, yes, Jesus came and said, Samaritan, uh, Samaritan woman, that the day who, they are in, 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 uh, that now we do not need to worship God on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. That's true. God is everywhere. You can pray everywhere. But there are places where he manifests himself. That's what David is telling us. In, talking about what the psalmist is telling us in verse 3. Who, can as, who may ascend into the hills of the Lord or may stand in his holy place? De, for example, Jacob was walking with God. But it was only in Bethel that God manifests himself to him. That was a dwelling presence. But he was walking in faith all along. The same with Abraham. There was, he was, until when he was under a tree that he had an encounter. There are places where God dwells, and one of which is his temple, his house. There is not, there is not, there is not uh, uh, two ways about it. We, we are supposed to praise God everywhere. We are supposed to make time to come. God, God, God is not, he was not stupid or he is not foolish to institute the church. And tell and Jesus told Peter, you are the rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Or you are the rock upon which I shall build my church. He was talking even about the physical church. That was why the temple was built. And in the temple, we had the holies of holies. Hallelujah. Amen. So it means that there are places and there are hills 
There are particular places, one of which is the church. We should note that. And in verse 4, it says, Who? He who. Okay, sorry, let's link three and four so that we understand it well. He says, Who may ascend into the hills of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He answers it. He who has clean hands and pure hearts, who has not lifted up so his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. Amen. Amen. Now, what does that mean? It means there are characteristics that we need to have before we can ascend into his holy place, nor enter into his holy, uh, uh, into the hills or enter into his holy place. Amen. And now, and he listed these characteristics, people with what? Pure hearts and clean hands. Is your heart pure? Are our hands clean? Sworn to idolatry, lies. Let's examine ourselves. If we, these four characteristics, this is what we need to stand in the holy place of the Lord. These are the four things. And in verse 5 he says, He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The first prophetic part, the God of his salvation. Salvation had not come. But David now was talking about the God of his salvation. He was talking about Jesus Christ. But you know, when we begin to sit and those who call themselves scholars, they tell you that the, his Old Testament is new. The, Jesus is even more in the Old Testament, even, even more than in the New Testament. But we need to uncover him. David is talking about Jesus Christ, the God of his salvation. But there are blessings that we have to get. I want us to be noting them. One of them, the second one is righteousness. The Bible says the righteousness we get is the righteousness of Christ. We cannot walk righteousness with our hands. We get it by faith in Christ Jesus. But those are the blessings that we associate with those who shall enter into the holy place of the Lord. With their pure hearts, with their clean hands, who have not sworn to idolatry nor deceitfulness. And he said, this is Jacob. Jacob. Jacob is Israel. The generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Who is this talking about again? Which generation? This generation. That is why Jesus, Jesus came in Matthew 7, 7 and said, Ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Amen. Now, David said, we will seek him. But Jesus says, Ask, seek, knock. But David also spoke about the God of his salvation. But Dave, the revelation of the knocking face was not given unto David. Because the Messiah had not come. That is why when Jesus came, we have access now to knock. I will, I will go further and we'll understand. I will use the analogy of the temple and we'll understand the knocking face that Jesus has given us, has brought, that we are dwelling in. This is the generation. So we are so privileged to live in this generation that we can seek God and find him. And now we go to verse 7 to 10. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord God of hosts. Hallelujah. Now, I would like us to look at the temple of God. If we read the Bible, in, 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 if we read in the, in the scriptures in Psalm, the book of Second Samuel, in the Kings where the, and the Chronicles, where the temple was described, the Bible says it had a gate. And you have the inner court, the outer court, the inner court. And the holy of holies, isn't it? Now, so let's try to picture our church like the temple that was in Jerusalem. 
let, but this is the church, let's say there is a fence. You know, we open a gate of you can enter. You don't just enter the house, isn't it? You walk in the court. That's the outer court. So when you open the first door, you get the in, let's say this is our church. This was the church. Now this is the inner court. We open the door. This is the inner court. And the pulpit that was called the Holy of Holies. It had a veil that was blocked. And who were who was uh, it was every was everyone allowed to enter the holy of holies no only the high priest so he was at the time and before he goes the bible says he has to sanctify himself so to enter into the holy of holies he has to purify himself so now it comes back to what david is saying he with pure hearts and clean hands can enter but there was a veil that stopped us from entering the holy of holies we can enter into right up to the innermost court. And now what did Jesus say? The scripture tells us in the New Testament, says, our bodies are what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. That is the temple of God. So in the same way, we have our gate, our outer court, an inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And where was God dwelling? Or where is God dwelling in the temple? Is it in the outer or the inner court? In the Holy of Holies. So that is the place that God wants to sit in our hearts. That is the place that God wants us, true believers, to let him come in. That is what Jesus was speaking about in Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and what? If anyone opens, I will come in. Hallelujah. He was not knocking at the gate. So it meant that he was talking, not so because this is a this are messages we often preach to those who want them to receive Jesus. So Jesus stands at the door and knock. Now, for us, when we accept Jesus into our life, we become, he says he has given us the right to become what? Sons of God. So the gates are open, but Jesus stands at the door. It's another dimension. We need to open the door for him to come in. It means that. We have the power to open the doors and to close the door. We have the power to open our gates and to close it. We can open it for who we want to come in or who we want to go out, isn't it? If I come to your house, I knock your door. You, you peep through this. If you see you don't want me in, will you open the door? No. Jesus is standing at the door. He's knocking. The devil is standing at the door also knocking. I said this message is two ways. So it, it is our discretion of who we open to. We let them come in. Come in and dine with us. And in Psalm 104, he says, wait, he says what? David says, I will enter his gate with thanksgiving and his court with praise. I said, David did not have the revelation of the holies of holies. That was why he ended at the court. He was not a high priest. Hallelujah. So the, the, the thanksgiving phase that David is talking about is the gate phase. Once, now, you know, when we accept Jesus, I am born again, I am born for victory, that is the thanksgiving phase. That is what they call the first phase. That's the phase that Jesus was saying, if you ask, you will receive. Ask that Jesus come into my heart, or I accept you, it's easy. Like I say, I accept you, and you tell, I don't, I don't want you. It's easy, isn't it? So that is the first phase. And now if we go to praise, is that, that is the level that you do not, even God does not give you something. You thank him. That is the phase that David was talking about. And those are for those, that are reserved for those who are in the court. Hallelujah. That is the court phase. When we seek him, we find him. But the last phase, the knocking phase, that was not revealed to David. It was the holy of holies. That we have to knock. That is what caused us now to do power. To use the, 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 the power of God. The manifesting power. To, to, to allow God to use us as an instrument. That we can command. And things happen. That is the phase we are talking about. The knocking phase. So why are we gates? Why are we gates? Why was David referring to us? Because this same uh, verse 7, we can look at it. When we look, when we'll be looking next week, we'll be looking at the gates of the enemy. We understand that there are ancient gates and everlasting gates. Why do we call us gates? 
It means we have that power and ability. You know, the Bible says, let me put it this way. This world that we are living in, we are at war. Both God and the devil are looking for let me see, flesh to dwell in. That they may, ex they may exercise or fulfill their purpose on earth. Now, when the devil tempts you spiritually, when it does not come true, he tempts us through our mind. You know, sometimes, for example, if you think of committing fornication, you can, after some time, you can say, ah, or there is no possibility, or you don't have the heart, or to, maybe you see a lady and it's only in your mind. But now, when the devil wants to come now physically, because he already knows how you think. You know, he has dealt with you in your mind. Now he has to bring, now the, the availability of a, of, a, of a soul that does not know him. Now he comes into another soul, maybe a soul of a woman. Then that makes, that, and she makes, and the devil makes her to look extremely beautiful in a way that you cannot resist. Then he, bring, he present, it, uh, present her before you, if you are a man. You see that it becomes easy for you to fall. Because he's psychology, he has already dealt with you in your mind. So that is why it's very important as students of God, those who associate ourselves around with. If you associate, uh, you say I'm strong and I associate myself only with those, uh, let's say, let's call, let me use the word unbelievers, for instance. At some point in time, though you are strong and you pray, but those that are around you are like vessels that they, that they, they make themselves available for the enemy to use and get to you easily. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. That is why we are, we are gates. That but it says what? We should lift up our heads. When the Bible talks about lift up our head, what does it mean? We should look up. For behold, our help comes from, from whence does our help come from? It comes from the Lord. So each time the Bible talks about lift up, it means we have to lift up ourselves and look upon God and trust in God for help. That is why it says, lift up your head, O ye gates, and ye everlasting doors. Hallelujah. Amen. Why everlasting doors? Why would God, or why would devil be, or God be referring to us as everlasting doors? We have, thank you, man of God. Ah, it means we have the ability to live for eternity. But the Bible says God is what? From everlasting to everlasting. We are everlasting, but we serve a God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Say, this is me and this is everlasting. It goes this way. From when I was created, I can only live and go this way, not this way. But God is from there. That's why they call him the Alpha and the Omega. He is from everlasting to everlasting. That is why he's calling upon us as eternal beings to lift up our heads unto the Lord. To open our gates unto him. Open that eternal door that he may come in, that we may dwell with him for, eternal, for, for eternity. It means that if we do not open and allow God to come in, the devil comes in and where do we spend eternity? In hell. So one way or the other, we have to spend eternity. So it's our choice to choose where we want to spend it. There is no, there is no two ways around it. Hallelujah. And he says that the king of glory shall come in. And he begins to ask, who is this king of glory? He is the Lord, strong and mighty. He is the Lord, mighty in battle. Why was David using this description? We read it in the book of Samuel, chapter 5. No, David has seen God. God has used David. He has protected David. But in this, no, when God takes us, he says he's taking us from glory to glory. But I think this was the first time that God showed David another dimension of who he is. That God himself went ahead of him and fought for him. God did that to Gideon. He showed that in the days of Elijah. When, 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 he, when Elijah prophesied that by this time tomorrow. The Bible says the Syrian army had sound or like chariots. There was the, the chariots of heaven riding. They had it and they flee. But this was the first time. That was why David was, that was when David understood that he was a God mighty in battle. God fights. He is the Lord God of hosts, the Lord of the army of heaven and of earth. 
He has all of them. He was the God of the army of Israel. Hallelujah. So now when, when the Bible talks about the Lord of the host, in Hebrew, there are two, three different meanings. If we look in Exodus chapter 7 verse 4, host means human armies. So because sometimes we pray and we say the Lord of hosts, but we do not know. Because if we know some of the names of God and the attributes and when we use them, then we, we know the power that we are commanding. Sometimes we speak it, but because we lack understanding, that power does not manifest. This is one way you use the Lord of hosts. You are using the, one of the greatest dimensions of God. You means you are asking God to descend as the army of earth and the heavenly army. But that is when we are in typical warfare. That's when we invoke the Lord of hosts. But sometimes we declare it without knowing. If you read in Exodus chapter 7 verse 4, that is where the Lord, you see God refer as the Lord of human armies. But now a host in, in also can also mean celest, uh, celestial bodies. That's the sun, the moon, and the stars. We can see that in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 26 and Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Where host is referred, as, referred to celestial bodies. So therefore we can say that the Lord of hosts is the sovereignty of God over the powers of the universe. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So now when David was saying that who shall come, he says the Lord God of hosts. He was talking about the Lord of the heaven and the earth army. He, means he knew that because he has been using in the first phase of the battle. He was the Lord of the, heaven, the earth army, his army that fought. In the second phase, it was heaven's army that fought. The battle. Hallelujah. So that is why if we look, when David was facing Goliath, David had understanding. The Bible says when, Goliath, when, when, when he came before Goliath with stones, the Goliath began to ask, am I a dog? And the Bible, the, the Bible says, Goliath said, I come against, you, against the gods of the Philistines. The God of this mountain. And when the, the spiritually, when David perceived or saw that he has invoked a power that was maybe greater than the one he came with, his, with his stones, then he says, I come against you again in the name of what? The Jehovah Lord God of hosts. He means he, that was what one stone could kill the giant. You know what the giant is? One simple stone. Because it, that stone came with heaven. Hey, it came with heaven. Heaven backed the stone. Hallelujah. Amen. So now we have that understanding of we as human beings, we are temples. We have holies of holies. But I want, as I said, it's a moment for us to evaluate ourselves. Ask yourself, where is Jesus? Where is God in my life? Not in the life of your brother. Of my life. Is he at my gate? Is he in my court or is he sitting in the stool in the holy of holies? Hallelujah. Amen. Where is Jesus sitting? Where is God in your life? That is the question we should be asking ourselves. Amen. Amen. Now, so there are, I want us to look because there are different ways. I've, put, I've categorized four of them. Different ways in which we receive the king of glory. In which we receive God in our life. The first group of people are those that receive him into their house and not into their heart. Now, before we go to this, remember the, the, the Bible talks about the man at the beautiful gate. He was going to the beautiful gate every day for what? Begging for arms. Did he go in? The Bible did not record that he was going into the temple. He stood at the gate. It takes grace and mercy for us to be located at the gate because there are places where God manifests. When Peter and John came, the Bible says he looked at because of mercy. He says, silver and gold we do not have. But Jesus, we have to give you. What did it, it means he was standing at the gate. Instead for him, of him to enter the gate and go into the temple, he stood at the gate. He was looking at the immediate. And when Jesus came in, the Bible says he rose up and walked. And when he walked, what happened? Did he go home? Where did he go to? Back in the temple. So my brothers and sisters, there are things and challenges that 
we are suffering from, that we are we, that is that constrain our lives, that because we allow Jesus at the gate or we are seated at the gate, instead for us to come into the temple to come to church does not mean you are in church because if the Bible says we are in the world but we are not of the world, you are in church, you are not of the church. That's right. The things of this world, don't they teach us? That's what was Jesus saying. We can still come to church and we are not in the church. But, and the evidence of this is that there is no transformation in our lives. The things we used to do, we still do them. We still have a long way to go. We are not in this, That is one evident. If the things you used to do that you know are wrong and you are in church, those things don't change, or you don't struggle. Let's say it's your weakness, and you are struggling with it. If you used to do them ten times a week, it should come down to eight. Then you know that you are getting somewhere. Yeah. The God of mercy will help you. The God of mercy will help me. Hallelujah. Yeah. So some receive this God in our, in their house, but not in their heart. Let's look at Luke chapter seven, verse forty-four. Hallelujah. Is somebody there? The church is silent. I have not heard I receive. <laughs> Amen. People are not receiving this one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, okay. And, and, and he turned to the woman and said, and said unto Simon, See, you, this woman, I enter into your house. You gave me water. You gave me water. You gave me no water, sorry, for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the head. Can we just take to, just put 44, just put up 44 to 49. Let's just take this one. The other one will take it quick and shorter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want us to get a clear picture of this example. And 40, 40 to 49, let's 45 says, you, get, you gave me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. And 47 says, Whosoever, what, where so, wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is given, the for to whom little is given, the same loves little. And he said unto her, Your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at food with him began to say within themselves, Who is this? Is that now Jesus? Remember, if we read this story from the beginning, he was talking about. Simon the tax collector. The Bible says when, when he met Jesus, he invited Jesus into his house. He gave Jesus food. But now he talks about a woman who was known to be a prostitute. <laughs> and she came with an alabaster, uh, alabaster box and calabash and break it in the, at the foot of Jesus. Now we saw that Simon believed, believe, he is like many of us. We accept Jesus, but our heart are not there. In other words, we open our gates. I have accepted Jesus. I am the son of God, we say. Jesus has come in, but the doors of our hearts are not open. Though Jesus was on the table and eating, he, did not, he was not ready to give all to Jesus. Probably it was a trap to lure him, to listen to him, and then maybe get a reason to accuse him. But this woman who had been living in sin, that's why practically, if you see, most of us are coming from Christian homes that we've been going to church. Going to church become a culture to us. And sometimes some of us will say, uh, I, I will go to church today because I have bought this new dress. I will show them. Some of us miss church for the reason that I have been repeating this dress for too long. They will call my name, that, that sister with the red dress or that brother with the black trouser. That is the reason. I'm talking practicality. Okay, we smile. This is truth. It is truth. 
You know, when truth enters, you get to see how the bodies are, are making. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is why we are in church. I don't care to come to church with one dress, Monday, January to December, so long as I know it's for God. Look at it the way you want. That is how we are. That is the mindset. I'm trying to change how we think. Instead of looking at the brother and say that brother has black one black trouser, if you have two, give him one. If you have three, give him one. If you, if you don't have money to buy, give him the old one. Because you can think that he has one trouser, but each time he is blessing other people. Because he doesn't see that out dressing to be something important to him. You know, we are very quick to criticize and point out the wrong things rather than the good things. If you see a brother who is giving too much, you cannot say, ah, the way this brother is giving, I will learn to start giving like this brother. But we see, say, see that one. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this, is, this is one example. So we begin to ask ourselves, which at the end of it, we should be able to identify where we find ourselves. Those are people who accept Jesus. You invite even the man of God to his house, to your house. He's happy to come. He prays. He gives you food. That way he goes, that one. The way he eats, eats langama. <laughs> that is truth. That is practicality. What happens? We are laughing, but it's the truth. And the second group, some open their hearts, but not their house. Do you we, we think that is possible? We do not open the gate for Jesus to come in, but we open the holies of holies. He comes because we open. He says, Spirit is everywhere. Now, what do I look? Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. If, so, if somebody there can I hear you say amen. amen. What does Matthew chapter 8 verse 8 says? The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be here. Hallelujah. Amen. We have this message, is, this is always used to preach faith, which is good. It's very few people in the world can exercise this type of faith. That's why Jesus said, I have not seen this kind of faith. But what did he say? My roof, I'm unworthy for you to come under my roof. But then, by grace, because he showed faith, God act. Hallelujah. Now, who are this group of people? There are people who come to church because you have a situation. You don't even believe that, that God that they are talking about. But say you have a health problem. You come to church. You say, if the man of God only lay his hand on me today, I will be healed. Like the, the woman with the issue of blood. Mm -hmm. That was faith. At that instant, you are exercising faith. And Jesus, God works. Because he's a God of principle. But Bible says, when your faith gets to that point, he acts. Mm -hmm. you, you receive that you are not, you've not accepted Jesus in your home. These are the people who come to church when they are in need. And they come, they fall under the unction. They receive prophecy and they go and they are blessed. And when they have it, another problem, they come. That is the second category. So which category do you belong? The third category. Some neither accept Jesus into their heart nor into their house. No way they don't. Let's look at Matthew 8.34. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Hallelujah. Jesus came into a region. The whole city came. And beg him not to even enter. Just go. And the Bible refers to them as what? The graceless. Is it? Gergesens. When the. Gatherings. Some gatherings on Gergesens. And it's hard to. Yeah. Let, let maybe, maybe those. So maybe those who are linguists. They can help us. Those who have gone to school. Let's look at 28. Give us verse 28. So that the church will pronounce it. So that we also learn. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Amen. We learn every day. Amen. Amen. Verse 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gegesens. Thank you. Gegesens. So now, this is, listen to what happened here. If we read it right down to verse 34. The Bible says, when Jesus came to this city, he met two men who were possessed with demons. And when they saw him, they began to cry out and said, what have you come to do here? Please, if you want to cast us out, they call, refer, him to, refer to him as the son of God. Throw, cast us into the, into the heads of the swine. And Jesus did. They went and died. And the, the shepherd, or the, the person who had the, is he call it, not shepherd, the, 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 the not flock, is he head? A head of, of, of pigs, yes. The head, man. the head man. So he went and told this to the city, and the city came because they have been hearing about this Jesus. And they beg him. Now, these are people in our society and around us that knows God, that see the goodness of God, but refuse to accept him. Some call themselves atheists. Those are the group. They fall under there. There are some who even come and see like that and say, those things is black magic. They use adjectives. They use things. Even when they see the visible power and they see a lame man walking, they see blind, see somebody you know in your community, yet you do not accept. These are the people that fall under that category. And the fourth category are those that accept God to come both into their heart and into their house. And it's my prayer that we all should be in this category in Jesus' name. Amen. We can look that in Luke chapter, 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It talks about Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, they will allow, we look Luke chapter 10 from verse 38, in our verse 38, we read verse 38, we can, so we put us verse 38, we can read just 38. It says, now it came to pass as they went, that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Mary and Martha received him into their house. And if you read further, the Bible says they, were, they made food for him and Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And even Martha was not happy because the sister was enjoying the good news while she was struggling to make food. And Jesus says, hey, Martha, busybody, she has chosen wisely. What she has received will live with her forever. No, Martha was doing good for to make food. The master was hungry. At the end of the day, Jesus needs to eat, isn't he? But now, why was she worried? Because she did not want to miss on the good news that, or, or the message. She wanted Jesus maybe to be silent. Let, or if Mary comes, they will finish faster. And then they will hear. Isn't it? So you see that those are people who hunger to be in their presence. And who wants to receive. Hallelujah. That is a category that hears the word of God and obey it and keep it and strive to work with it. Who allow Jesus to take this place? This is a category that we spoke about. That says that the time will come when true believers shall worship me in what? In spirit and in truth. We remember that was what Jesus was telling the woman in Samaria. People will not need to come to these mountains, neither will they need to come into Jerusalem. But the worship in every but true believers. Why would Jesus spoke about true believers? It means there are believers and there are true believers. Only true believers worship God in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you a true believer? Ask your neighbor. Are you a true believer? Yes, I cannot hear anybody. I just... So that is the question we should ask ourselves. Am I? Am I a true believer? Do I worship God in spirit and in truth? A gate. You are a door. Jesus is standing at the door and is knocking. That just open. Let me come in. I won't care about yesterday, but I want to be there and take you forward. He knows your pain. Like the example, the story that our executor gave. The mother saw what happened? But yet it was silent. 
God in his awesomeness. The Bible says he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's all-knowing. There is nothing that is hidden. Or that is. When we try to say we are made in the image of God, let's say I am God. Look my image. Because let's say let's take this physical image. And what does the Bible say? The earth is his footstool. That's where he put his leg. So you see, can you imagine how big God is? Look at the earth. Under his foot. He sees everything. He knows all things. All he wants is for us just to accept him and let him come in. He cannot force you. He cannot force me. That's what Jesus is saying. I stand and knock. If you open, I will come in. I will forget what you did yesterday. I'm interested to help you and take you where I want you to be. Hallelujah. So let's just open our hearts, dear brother, brothers and sisters, for the king of glory to come in. He will come in. Hallelujah. And in Psalms 118 verse 19 he says let's look at for Psalm 118 19 to, before we end hallelujah God just want us to come in he just want us to open let him come in he says open to me the gates of righteousness and I will go into them and I will praise the Lord this is what David says just open the doors of righteousness. And who is the God of righteousness? How do we gain righteousness? It's through Jesus Christ. So just, and Jesus says, I am knocking. So if you open, God is forgive, God will forgive your sin. And we receive the righteousness of God. And the blessings that David was talking about. And the fullness of the, or, or the fullness of the world, which is of the Lord. The fullness, the blessings. The, the, the pain will be taken away. Whatever it is that we desire and hunger, we just open our hearts, accept him sincerely, strive, and he is going to help us. It takes us gradually. It doesn't mean that when, you've, when God says, I will take heal you from the pain, the pain must not disappear, but it takes time. He is taking you there gradually. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I would like us to pray. Just three prayer points and then we... I'm sorry. It's a bit okay. <clears throat> the first prayer...